Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Lanza. I am an associate professor at the Keen Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And for me, it's a very great pleasure to uh, chair this nanoscientific symposium, which is organized by Park System and Nanoscientific. Today, I am very happy to have uh, this interview with Professor Sean O'Shea, who is one of the inventors of the conductive atomic force microscope uh, back in the 90s. Uh, Professor O'Shea uh, is uh, working right now in Singapore at the A-Star Institute. And uh, so uh, I think uh, it will be a very great pleasure to know more about this invention. So good morning, Professor O'Shea. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> good morning. Yeah. So uh, I guess everything is going well there uh, related to COVID-19. Everybody is fine and safe. Yeah, well, we started working again in the labs. We shut down for a small while, but uh, then we're back and working again. Singapore's been quite good at uh, shutting and controlling everything down. So uh, slowly getting back to speed, but okay, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, safety is the first. So I think the first obligatory question that uh, me and uh, my students and all the attendants of this symposium may have is if you could... Uh, briefly describe uh, how it happened, how uh, you and your colleagues came up with the uh, measurement of uh, electrical current at the nanoscale using an atomic force microscope. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so um, I, I, what, what was happening was I was working in Cambridge at the time uh, after I did my PhD in Sydney, uh, Australia. So I was working in Cambridge doing, uh, developing AFM there because the uh, AFM was developed in around 85, 86 by Christoph Gerber and Gerd Binning. And uh, so Mark Wellen was my boss there. And uh, so we were developing AFM, a small team developing AFM. And at the same time, uh, one of the postdocs joined from Oxford University, uh, Martin Murrell, had been looking at oxides. So he was very interested in looking at how these electrical oxides break down. And it's got a, quite a good history because the STM itself, one of the reasons they developed the STM was, was to look at thin oxides. So, but in those days, the gate oxides were very thick. They were like over 10 nanometers thick, so you couldn't use STM. So we said, ah, oh, why, why don't we try and use uh, AFM on these and make them conducting, try and measure the conducting. So what we did with a team of us, myself and Martin Murrell and a guy called Tim Wong who developed all the electronics and like we had this very good software uh, sort of digital controller, which was probably the first digital controller uh, ever made for uh, SPM. And so what we did, we got silicon tips and we got some samples from IMEC. Uh, Mark Hayes uh, gave us some samples there. So they were, they were state of the art oxides for then. They were 12 nanometers thick. <laughs> At that time, they were state of the art. And so we, we used uh, oxide tips, silicon tips. Sorry, not oxide tips, but at the end, we know now there's silicon dioxide at the end. <laughs> we high, highly doped silicon tips, and we just came down to the surfaces, put a voltage on, and measured the current because we had all the STM things in the lab. So we, we know how to measure small currents. So it's just a question of putting the voltage on, measuring the current. And the only trick we really did was, as you know, for oxides, we have to limit the, the current flow. Otherwise, as we found out quite early, everything just went boom, including the tip. <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, yes, exactly. So with the with this digital controller, we could just say, hey, when the current reaches a certain value, just turn it off, turn everything off. So we had a current limiting method directly with uh, software control. So, so with that, we were able to measure like the IVs and things on the on the VLSI oxides. Well. 12 nanometer thick LSI oxides. So, so that was the first data. So it wasn't so hard to implement. Uh, but as it turns out, interpreting it is more difficult than just doing the measurement. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so uh, one of the reasons we were doing that was like there was a debate at the time whether the actual the breakdown voltages being measured 
like in a, in a capacitor type structure, uh, were actually indicative of the material itself or were there like localized defects over the capacitor area, which like weak spots that, that were leading to a lower breakdown field than if you just measured on the, the oxide itself. Uh, so that was sort of our motivation, the question. Uh, and we've found very high breakdown voltages in our first measurements uh, using this. Um, we were sort of very excited. Oh, yes, the, the local fields with STM, oh, sorry, AFM conduction tip can be much higher. But, but it turns out, of course, it was all to do with the tip. Uh, so what we were doing, we were working in air, and what we were doing, putting the voltages on, was just growing the oxide or whatever, something underneath the tip. So we needed much higher voltages to break down not just the oxide, but also whatever was growing under the tip. So, so that was a bit of a red herring. And when we did the job properly a bit later on with uh, metal tips and things like that, we found, and diamond tips, we found that the actual field to break down the, the oxide was exactly the same or thereabouts. Uh, is what they were measuring, uh, you know, on the standard MOS type capacitor structures. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so okay, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the problem was working in air. So, you know, as you know, you start to grow things under the under the tip. So, so, so we did the usual things. Now we we sort of did a few tricks. One was the easier one was trying to pull the electrons from the substrate. Mm -hmm. That seemed to stop things growing so much under the tip so that that was you know what we found uh, and then the other thing is to work in vacuum so we we built a vacuum system and Mark Lance and myself did a fair bit of work there trying to understand the actual conduction AFM and how it under relates to the contact area and and there we worked on like a slightly more exotic material like niobium solenoid nice and flat uh, so that we didn't do so much the breakdown of the oxides, but we're trying to understand how the relationship between the forces and the current flow. And, and they seem to match all the theories quite well, with the exception that there's, there's still, an, still an issue with, uh, you know, actual knowing the contact area as an absolute <laughs> value. You can always see the relative changes, okay, but absolute values remain very, very difficult, in my opinion. Uh, to, to nail down, you know, for, for these sort of things. And just to finish that little story there, like uh, this growth of the oxide underneath, we were very irritated with it, you know, because it was <laughs> mucking, up, mucking up our experiments. And so, oh, how do we get rid of this? How do we... And it turns out at the same time, there was a group in the US using this to actually do lithography. So they yeah. actually used the <laughs> phenomena to actually write it down. So, so we missed out on a good paper there. We, we thought it was this very annoying thing. It turns out it's actually quite useful to actually do <laughs> lithography. So, yeah, so it was fun days, you know, trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah, so. Well, that, that is very interesting because uh, it looks like um, it was a little bit unpredictable what could happen for the first measurements, right? Because you encounter some uh, experimental non-idealities during the measurement that affected the values that you were uh, targeting until you could uh, successfully get this uh, breakdown feel of the silicon oxide. So you mentioned that in your first experiments, you, you didn't use a metal coated silicon tip, you just used a highly doped silicon tip? Yes, yeah. that's correct, yeah. And then, so l later on we realised that was part of our problem. Uh, you, we could clean them up in UHV conditions, the silicon tips, mm -hmm. uh, but we were having real troubles in, in air, in ambience. So, uh, so at that time we started making our own metal wire tips. You know, we, we would squash the wires, small wires, between two bits of mica to make the flat bit of the cantilever and then etch the end. Uh, using standard etches, wet etches. So we were mainly using gold, making gold wire levers like that, hand-by-hand -hand levers. And the other sort of really good thing for us is Philip Niederman at that time in Neuchatel in Switzerland was developing the heavily doped diamond levers. So he, he kindly sent us some of the first levers he was making. We started using those and they turned out to be much better <laughs> for, for our purposes the, the, than the silicon ones. So... So, you know, that, that was interesting as well. So, 
So the silicon levers, metal levers, and diamond levers, and to be honest, I still use those. <laughs> That's the ones <laughs> I still use in the lab. Uh, it's, it still remains one of the main issues, doesn't it? Like this, the yeah. problem with the tech is still to me a, this very difficult problem to, uh, to overcome in conduction AFM. And whenever something new comes along, I always try it and I always have the same problems, like getting consistency uh, with the tips. Like, uh, I don't know about you guys out there, but, you know, you come down onto a surface and then invariably, like, not all the time, but, like, invariably something goes wrong. Like, there's something with the tip or you have to try and move the tip on the surface and get it conducting. We, we always try and test our tips uh, we always have something conducting it, like uh, to try and test it on nearby. Like um, at the moment in the UHV system, we, we can clean them up fairly well. We do an iron bombardment, argon iron cleaning of the tips, and then they, they're usually okay. Usually, not always, usually. But And then in ambient, we always have something nearby. Like at the moment yes. we're working, Alec will give a talk later, I believe, uh, on these 2D materials, they're always resting on something, you know, so we put a bit of gold or something nearby and try and come and test the, the tip. Is, is the tip okay? Uh, no. And I would say half the time the answer is no. <laughs> you have to try and clean it up, clean it up yeah. or do something. And so I think it gets back to this question of quantifying what's going on. Is That's one of the reasons it's so difficult to actually get absolute values, uh, quantitative values, uh, relative things, okay but yeah it's still still difficult uh to yeah. know what's going on even in uhv it's like it's just difficult and the problem is the tip you know what's happening with the tip mm. uh, electrically because electric even in but it, even it, in ultra high vacuum difficult. even in ultra high vacuum you will have an additional factor which is the contact force right which not only changes the the, um, the contact area between the tip and the sample but moreover you can add some and uh, non-negligible uh, pressure into the samples that could induce other effects in some materials, like, for example, uh, flexoelectricity or piezoelectricity in hafnium oxide. So I think uh, there are many variables in this uh, system. And for that reason, I think um, uh, it is extremely important to provide information statistically. Uh, however, I see... Um, Conductive AFM is a tool, in my opinion, in which uh, we see that many institutes have uh, an AFM, but uh, few institutes have really experts on conductive AFM who publish papers in which all the values are demonstrated statistically. Normally, you see these papers with one uh, IV curve, but in order to be able to understand uh, the conduction of one material, we need to provide uh, not one, but maybe 300. So uh, what is your opinion about this? You, you guys in your lab uh, uh, repeat the experiments many times. I think this is useful for the students here in us. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, oh, uh, Alec, my, my, he's a postdoc now, my previous student with, with Professor Pay at SUTD. Yeah, we... Yes, you do many, many IVs. <laughs> he will tell you many and many tips and many, you know, and you, we also to try and figure out what's going on. Uh, so, yes, statistics is very important because it's probably one of the few handles we have on the trying to get reliable data uh, is to do it statistically. Yeah? It's a bit like uh, measuring adhesion as well. Like you can't just have one number, like it's a different community who measure adhesion on surfaces and that, but, but you never just give one number, never. They, they do hundreds of adhesion curves, pull-off curves to get the statistical data because that's what you need. And I think we're a bit the same. It's like you, you have to try different tips, like same tip, and just see if they give consistent data on a particular sample. And do many and do many curves. You, you must. Uh, I think otherwise the data is just a bit meaningless because you because we don't know what's happening with the tip. Uh, so yeah, so hundred percent agree with you there. It's like it's a difficult problem, but statistically, the statistics is the way to tackle it. I think uh, since we don't have a better handle at the moment on, on the problem. Yeah. So We're lucky that the industry of. Uh uh, electrical probes for atomic force microscope have been developed 
in parallel with the development of this technique. And uh, we have seen many new tips that have appeared. And there is one that has uh, become quite popular, uh, which is this uh, solid platinum tips uh, that seem to work uh, quite well, even if there is not much flexibility on the number of, uh, of a spring constant. And also uh, it, it seems that sharpening this kind of solid platinum tips is a little bit more difficult than uh, standard silicon tips. So I wanted to ask you if you have used these tips, what is your opinion about this kind of tips? Oh yes, uh, we, we like them. Yeah, we, we, we do like them, we use them. The, uh, we, we've, we've found that the, the platinum ones, well at least how we use them, like in contact mode, tend to get a little blunt, but you still get data out of there. So we've sort of, trying now the platinum iridium ones that they make and we'll see if they're any hard well, they are harder nominally but we'll see how we go but yeah i i think they're a good way to go because i'm sorry i should one of the good ways to go they're they're like we also like the diamond tips we do like the sister contact area will probably be a bit larger than the, than the other the other style of tips because they in contact mode anyway they they will get slightly blunt but they they do appear to give consistent results. You will always have the same problems like if layers of something get, like say you have one monolayer or something on the end of the tip, then you'll always get funny results. So there'll always yeah. be that problem that you have to resolve, whether it's a solid platinum or, but at least with the solid platinum, when you remove it, uh, and, and you can just by scanning or something like this, then you can say, aha, okay, we actually, we have no other problems with the tip. <laughs> we know we've yeah. got rid of what's on the end and, and it's okay. Whereas the semiconductor ones, you know, silicon or metal coated silicon, is this really true or can I really believe it? Because it's, it's not a metal now, it's a semiconductor. Because uh, what we found like the, many, those many years ago when we did our work in UHV, myself and Mark Lance, uh, it's like we, we could only be really confident about the metal the metal contact, the metal on metal contacts, or me we couldn't be con as confident about what we were measuring when there were semiconductors in terms of trying to understand the absolute values. Nice. But when there are semiconductor tips involved, we, we always had a little, a uh, little bit of an issue, yeah, about trying mm -hmm. to understand what, what the actual uh, numbers were coming out. Yeah? You can still get relative changes, no problem, but uh, absolute values again, a, a bit of an issue. So, yeah. sorry, that was a very long answer to, yes, we quite like, the, <laughs> very good answer. Quite like the, solid, the solid metal type of tips. Mm. Uh, whether someone can put one on silicon levers and sort of, you know, people, I don't know if they still do it, but in the old days, yeah, people were trying to glue or attach like metal, you know, little tiny metal things to silicon cantilevers and things like to get the solid tip, to get the solid mm. metal tip. I think it's by nice. far preferred. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, also, uh, I, I think the I think this this has been great because as as you cannot uh, let's say damage the coating, you just have the whole uh, tip solid. I think uh, uh, at least you can you avoid one of these um, uh, ways of degrading the tips. Of course, if you get things attached to the tip, you still see funny data as you mentioned. Um, I also. Uh, wanted to ask your opinion about another important development uh, that uh, some companies are starting to introduce, which is the measurement of current in, uh, in tapping mode. I think yes. a couple of companies are doing this kind of intermittent contact uh, uh, measurement uh, of current. And uh, uh, I think uh, it is, I, I have seen in my group that it starts to work better for soft materials like polymers, uh, which is something that for flexible electronics and other fields can uh, represent a very important advancement. So I wanted to ask if you have uh, experience on this, uh, on this uh, technique or what is your, uh, your opinion about this? Uh, I don't have much experience because we usually use contact because uh, we're always doing these breakdown type measurements at the moment. I think it's a great method uh, I think especially for it's like seeing uh, taking images uh, you know to see you know uh, conductivity changes across the surface I think yeah yeah it's, it's very good 
because it saves a tip, yeah. uh, which is one of the key things you're trying to do uh, with these tips. No, no, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a very good method for, for trying to uh, understand the con conductivity of a surface. Yeah. Uh, it just depend, you know, it depends what you're trying to do, of course, in all these experiments. So, so, so for our ones, we're trying to be a bit like a, like a capacitor type measurement, you know, the MOS. So you know, we like to sit on the surface, contact mode, ramp it up so it looks a bit like a capacitor this sort of game but uh if you're after like these soft materials in that way yeah it's probably very problematic to do that <laughs> yeah this tapping mode approach is probably very good yeah probably a really good way especially if you're trying to see changes across a surface yeah you know and then maybe zoom in don't you probably zoom in on specific parts that of interest yeah yeah it's, it's a good way to do it because yeah. mm -hmm. there's no way you'd scan in contact mode <laughs> it's just, yeah you just you just don't scan you don't scan uh, in contact <laughs> mode uh, you yeah. always damage the tip so uh, um, so we do the same actually we, we image in tapping mode uh -huh. and then we come down on the regions of interest to us uh, ah I see. I see i see yeah yeah so yeah so there's no way you're scanning tap uh, contact mode so, yeah so a very yeah, good yeah. method i think yeah of course yeah tune yeah so actually, this is just one of the little developments that have experience in conductive FM science. Uh, we have seen many others, like some companies are also offering logarithmic preamplifiers to measure several orders of magnitude of the current from picoamps to milliamps in the best of the cases. So I think that there have been, uh, since you and your friends invented this technique, there have been uh, some developments. I wanted to ask you, uh, what is your opinion and your feeling about this? I mean, did you expect so many developments and, and that this becomes such a consolidated tool in the world of, um, of nanoelectronics? And what is your opinion for the next years? Do you think, is there anything that has been covered yet that you may encourage uh, companies to try to uh, improve the, their service in that specific field? Oh. Well, well, give us better tips. <laughs> but that's extremely difficult, of course. That's very... No, I think there'll, there'll always be a need, you see. There'll always be a need because the materials are always going to be there. And even new material, like all these 2D materials, who, who would have thought 10 years ago we were investing so much effort trying to understand the electrical properties of 2D materials? So I think there'll always be a need for the localised conduction measurements. Uh, for this con uh, conduction AFM, yeah, sure. I think all these things that could help, like like you say, the tapping mode type of thing is relatively new. Uh, and, you know, that's that's been great. You know, for uh, I for me, the problem is always the tip, always the tip. Uh, the, the other, of course, the other big thing that we haven't talked about is the Kelvin probe type measurements, and, and there I think there's some more. Uh, for companies trying to develop things. So I think, you know, doing the Kelvin probe in liquid environments, I, I think is still a challenge because uh, the, the more recent methods are like based on, you know, phase detection or like FM type detection to get the FM, uh, you know, to get the Kelvin probe working correctly where, where the slope of the curves are changing most rapidly. So it's quite interesting to me that, you know, that, Kelvin probe with FM detection and it's like if you're trying to do that in liquids that, that was one of the big issues in liquids as well how do you get FM detection going in liquids like, like 15 years ago it was a big issue to get atomic resolution so it's quite so it's marrying the Kelvin probe problem FM detection in liquids with what what had to be done to get uh, atomic resolution in liquids so it, that's still a nice open problem I think. Uh, of course they do Kelvin probe thing in air and things because uh, the quality factors are higher. And so the issues when you drop down to liquids you have all these FM detection issues and problems again which are solvable, they're solvable but someone has to do it. Yeah. So, so that would be a nice one for working in liquids. Why work in liquids with Kelvin probe? Because I think you'd get a more uh, understandable interfaces compared to working in air. In air, you know, you have always have the stuff on the surface or you have meniscus or something. You, you, again, you, you might have a better chance to get good absolute values uh, of the work functions and things if, if you're working in a liquid. So that would be a nice uh, new, 
new advance, I think, if you FM detection for Kelvin probing liquids. So it sounds specialized, but I think it might it might <laughs> be useful, you know? like like as a distinct from air, you know. Air you always have these uncertainties, I think. I think. Yeah, I think that is a very, a very uh, special application and actually that is one of the advantages of the conductive FM that allow us to design uh, measurements in a very special way. Every experiment um, that I read, I, I see experiments combining um, external stress with uh, local fields with the tip. Uh, and also different techniques. Actually, I have seen some companies that are trying to integrate multiple tips into the uh, into the AFM. And also, recently, my group used one setup with in which we use an AF a conductive AFM that was inside the chamber of an SEM to do some uh, piezoelectric uh, oh, yeah. nano wires. This whole thing is quite encouraging, but at the same time, quite complex and. Uh, I think uh, you have been the pioneer on the study of uh, ultra thin dielectrics, and uh, but uh, you may agree that this can be used in many other fields, right? Yes, de definitely. Yeah, like like just measuring, especially if you like get that uh, like a, even a two probe type method going is is of course very interesting to all these uh, you know people trying to measure you know, conductivity and mobility and things on device level, or just the materials for us, really. Uh, if you can verify that things are happening, uh, you know, across a small scale, which is where, where you want to make devices in the first place, you know, you know, measure those things, me measurement. So I was going to say four probe, but I was thinking, you know, two probes probably, <laughs> probably enough of a challenge uh, to, to start with. Uh, you know, if you could get that going, that would be interesting as well. So that's like microfabrication of specialized tips, I suppose. Like specialized, you know, if you had two cantilevers and things like this. Yeah, so the microfabrication will, just in a general, it will always be a big part of this story of, you know, tips, mm -hmm. cantilevers, you know, four probe, two probe, trying, the microfabrication will always be there on in the AFM story as people try and develop new things. So, uh, you know, if you're a company trying to develop things, there's always that little niche that, uh, you know, if you can come up with different styles or different cantilevers and tips, and, you know, the all wire, the all solid like wire levers, you know, that's a small company now that sort of sells these things. And people like me buy them, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, so there's always that little niche for the microfabrication. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the the higher end bit, like like the actual microscopes and all that. As we know, things have become very consolidated in the last few years. You know, with essentially just two large companies uh, controlling a lot of the uh, a lot of the market. So so that one might be a bit harder to uh, to to break. You know. Uh, because things like cost and that really don't come into it so much. People are after performance. Uh, not You can build an AFM in your lab for like $5,000. I mean, yeah, but it's not going to do what you want. So people yeah. are really after performance. Uh, not, yeah. so, so that market, mm, a bit more tricky. So you've got to look for the niche at least to start and see where it goes, yeah, uh, is, is my humble opinion, yes. <laughs> <laughs> very useful, very yeah. useful. So um, I think uh, before concluding, I have to also to ask you one nearly obligatory question, which is which uh, uh, we know for all the problems that we have described and all these non-idealities, especially related to the deep and to the atmosphere, sometimes for CAFM researchers and students, uh, doing conductive AFM measurements can be very complex. We are sure that when we get good results, this is normally a very powerful paper because we can see information at the nanoscale, which is something you cannot do uh, with a probe station. But uh, which advice will you give all these researchers who spend hours fighting with the tips, with the scans, with the atmosphere? Which advice will you give for uh, all these students? Oh, <laughs> well, well, how do you advise a student? Uh, <laughs> If, if you want to get into this game, you you, you really got to have the passion. I mean, if, if you're just doing it to get little letters after your name, PhD, forget it. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> you, you have to have a you have to have a passion for what for, for understanding science at the nanoscale. 
it's not just conduction AFM. It's like all, all the things at the nanoscale. That there's always uncertainties. It's not like, uh, how, do, how do I put it? It's not like engineering at a, a larger scale and find things out <laughs> rather readily, rather easily. But at this, at this nanoscale level, everything's a challenge. Uh, and so you just have to persevere and stay there and uh, try and find where the science is and just hammer away at it. Uh, I have endless weeks. I still work in the lab. I have endless weeks in the lab in utter frustration. So trust me, it's, it never ends. It never ends. <laughs> so, yeah. so stay hang in there is my advice. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I think it's very interesting to know that even the leaders in this field have difficulties and that they are patient in order to work in the right direction to solve them. All right, so I think until here, uh, we don't have more time. Uh, we have already uh, consumed the 30 minutes that we had. Uh, I wanted to, to thank you very much for your time. Uh, it has been really a great pleasure, and I believe it will be very useful for all our attendants for this Nanoscientific Symposium. Um, so with this, uh, we will just finish. Uh, thank you again. I uh, wish you all the best uh, in your laboratory and that... Uh, uh, in that this COVID-19 uh, ends soon and we can meet uh, again in the conferences and in the labs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Mario. Thank you for your time as well. And we'll see how this goes. And I hope all goes well. Yeah, I, I really hope to visit you guys across there uh, sometime sooner rather than later. Yeah. All right, yeah, thank, thank you very you much. Anyway.